So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel over here. Uh, and they bring a number of different perspectives. To start uh, the dialogue, I was going to turn to Mr. Arya, uh, who is the managing trustee of uh, Srijan. Uh, with uh, your organization has uh, you know grown substantially over the la last 15 years. Uh, you have joined us in the sandbox and uh, helped implement some of the programs over here. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the journey that your organization has gone through over the last uh, thing, and how has it grown, and what is what have you, uh, you know, what is the tipping point or the scaling point where when you started accelerating? I thank uh, Desh Pandey Foundation to bring us all together here. Uh, Desh, Jayashree, uh, Naveen, Raj, Neelam. Uh, it's really a great uh, place to be uh, here to meet old friends also because there are a lot of people we know each other from before and uh, uh, this journey uh, uh, whether we reach a tipping point or not I am not so sure but let me give you a little bit of a background uh, to uh, what really drove me to set up my own organization and then tell you where we are uh, as uh, Raj said I worked with uh, Pradhan uh, from 84 to 97 an odd number of 13 years and I decided to branch off. Uh, one of the things that we uh, talk about Indian society and very often nowadays is that have Indian public system failed or continues to work for the people in particular, people in rural areas, uh, people who are poor, whether they are in rural areas or in urban areas. Several media events have highlighted this also very recently. Uh, back in 97, I raised this issue with Pradhan that uh, we continue to have projects which are oasis in development. We get lots of foreign funding or we get whatever private philanthropy funding, but we don't engage with the public sector. So I uh, requested uh, Pradhan to uh, uh, allow me to do a geo NGO collaboration study with support of Ford Foundation. Uh, uh, Ms. Ruth also was a program officer at that time. And we found out that there are several examples of government NGO collaboration in the state of Rajasthan and other places as well. So there are places we can find allies. It's possible to work with the public sector despite all its warts and all its efficiencies, inefficiencies and all its, so I can call, corruption. So I think we can find people. So that was one of the premises of starting Sijan. Uh, so one of the uh, whatever whether you call it a RBC or a WBC in our DNA is collaboration with government or basically a belief that alone we cannot make a difference. So from the day one we set up a program with Madhya Pradesh government then Rajasthan government then we came to Karnataka and we continue to work with the government in such a way that we do a co-production of the model and uh, in this uh, quest we have got also support from the World Bank often. So I think uh, this is one thing that uh, we do. In terms of theme, we identified water and agriculture which is in big crisis. While India grows at 8% or 6%, agriculture grows at 2%. So you can imagine for those who are economics students or uh, the student of agriculture economics that what is the productivity. In agriculture productivity, you look at wheat, we don't often cross 40 quintals per hectare. Well, I went to China, they have reached 60 quintals per hectare, which is a global productivity benchmark. So agriculture productivity across all crops, food crops, cash crops, soybean, wherever we work. We work with 30,000 poor families in 14 districts today. Three major programs we have are in soya, we have reached 12,000 farmers in one district. We have uh, worked with the Deshpande Foundation to reach 3,000 farmers in SRI. We work in dairy where we have reached about 4,000 farmers. So this is what uh, we try and do. And another just last point I want to make is that we uh, try and create an ecosystem within Srijan in such a way that the young people from colleges find it easy to come and make mistakes, work with the farmers and uh, communities, uh, women directly and build their capacities. So young people often make mistakes. So we want to really create a system whereby uh, they can grow by making mistakes. We can make extraordinary people out of ordinary people who can believe in themselves to bring about change 
in, in the society. We have 60 such professionals in Srijan. That's where we are. Uh, but I think there are a lot of challenges ahead, which I'm not getting into right now. Thank you. Very Great. Thanks, thanks for the overview. We'll get back to some of those challenges uh, as we progress with the dialogue. I'd like to turn to uh, Sri Das uh, to see your perspective, because you're approaching this problem from a different uh, uh, perspective, and you have scaled it uh, dramatically. So what, uh, how did you all get started? What helped? Uh, you know, where are you all right now, and how, uh, how big is it? Uh, thanks, Raj. It was in the year 2000, uh, Akshay Patra began. We started providing uh, cooked meals to 1,500 children in five schools on the outskirts of Bangalore City. Uh, at that time, we did not have any clear plan for making it big and so on. Uh, as soon as we started feeding, the first feedback we got that was in the month of uh, June or July of 2000. The headmasters told us that uh, more children are showing up in the school than it used to be before. The news had spread in the village that uh, a good meal is being provided at midday, and so more children were coming to the school. The second uh, feedback we got was that um, there were many instances of children fainting in the morning assembly, and now there are no such instances and, uh, of uh, children fainting. The third feedback was that uh, children have become very enthusiastic, very energetic in the classroom and outside the classroom, and that has encouraged the teachers also to do better. So these kind of simple feedback uh, encouraged us and affirmed that we are doing the right thing and we kept doing. But in the next three, four months, we started receiving uh, applications, letters written by other headmasters who would write to us and say, we see your vehicle pass in front of our school. Can you please stop and feed our children also? And uh, they would write s some more information. The children are all, uh, they are children of construction workers, and so they really need and so on. And in about three months, we had a pile of such letters. And one day we counted and we found there were requests for as many as 100,000 children. This is a story in Bangalore, not some underdeveloped part of Bihar or Chhattisgarh or any such place, the IT capital of the country. So it was very revealing to us uh, how much a meal means to these children and to these families, which we all take for granted. So it was at that time we decided to set up a large kitchen. At that time we set up a kitchen to feed 30,000 children. It was daunting. How are we going to manage the operations? So anyway, we, in about nine months we had a kitchen feeding 30,000 children. And then uh, we got invitations to go to other states, to come to Hubli. And since then we have been scaling. And today we are in nine states. We are in 17 locations, and we are feeding about 1.3 million children every day. So that's how the, in short, story Perfect. of Akshay Patra. Terrific. Thank you. That's uh, great work that you all are doing. Dr. Hegde, your uh, BAIF uh, has been uh, around for a while. It's uh, established back in 1967. You all have been doing a substantial amount of work. Can you just give us a little of that history and you know where you are and how extensive your operations are? Thank you, everybody. Uh, BIFE was started by a Gandhian called uh, Dr. Manive Desai. His focus was uh, providing sustainable livelihood to rural people. In the 67, you know, he realized that almost 75% of the farmers, landholders, have less than two hectares of land, most of them without irrigation. So. Dealing with agriculture means it, they will not be able to adopt any modern technologies. So he decided to go through animal husbandry route because people generally do not have good land. They have some animal as animals for their livelihood support. And uh, during that time, the milk was in such shortage that we were importing milk powder and uh, distributing through you know the dairies. So we decided that we should go through livestock development, particularly cattle development. Uh, the opportunity was uh, 
huge because our cows were giving only about 200 liters per year, whereas there was opportunity to go up to 5,000 liters. Then we adopted the technology. We trained the local boys, high school dropouts, to provide the breeding services. And uh, we got some support from industries and the planning commission to extend our services. Uh, during, that was a time when we had to go to farmer and say that, you know, if you want to give a message to take our service, we'll give you two rupees because people were not believing in technology. We had to pay him two rupees plus provide free service. But gradually, after showing the results, uh, we were able to demonstrate today that with three cows, you know, a family will be able to earn about 35,000 rupees in a year. That's well above the poverty line. Animals also provide manure for agriculture, bullocks for uh, agriculture, then also provide gainful employment, nutrition for the children and women. However, while going through the cattle, we also realized cattle alone will not be held by everybody, so we had to feed better quality fodder, so we introduced tree fodder because India had fodder shortage, we had also food shortage, so we could not have afford to devote good quality land for fodder. So we invented uh, or introduced uh, Subabul, the Hawaiian giant, to this country, which would grow like tree and you know grow on bad land, barren land, and use it as fodder. So that was a great success in the early seven, late 70s because you know it was a kind of called people call it miracle tree. Then we realized that if you want to improve the productivity of Subabul, you need to have watershed development. So we introduced watershed development as part of the agricultural development. Then with Subabul, we shifted over to horticulture because many farmers felt instead of having a tree with fodder and fuel, it's better to go for trees with fruits so that you know without cutting the tree, you should be able to get more money every year. Uh, Manibai always said that farmer has great wisdom. You have to listen to them and you know try to adopt. This is a case where he came into tree-based farming because of the intervention of the farmer. Finally, while doing these things, we also realized that women play a major role. Seventy percent of the labor comes from women. Unless you involve them, you will not be able to be successful. If you want to involve the women, we had to address two important things. The drudgery reduction, hardship. Children, women are suffering from ill health. Children are suffering from ill health. From morning to evening, the women are busy. But if you ask the child as to what your mother does, child simply says nothing because, you know, the value for the work she's done is uh, you know trivial. So we need to really empower the women and finally come to a conclusion that uh, there are the basic thing is if you want to improve the quality of, if you want to improve the development, it should be quality of life, not only money. And that is through livelihood, health, education, and good moral values. That's also very important. Manibai has been always quoting, you promote sugarcane, people have no work, they will have a lot of money to do, the young youth will become idle. You will spend more money in the bars than sp and money and time in the bar rather than the field. So it's important to have these four, like the you know development program in the Sanskrit we call Anna Akshar Arogya Acharan. You know four A's make the livelihood. How we when going to the community we also realize that the biggest problem in the country is you know we go with top to bottom approach. We go with a program and try to search who will be suitable. What we believe is we should have a doctor-patient relation even in agriculture. Like the doctor doesn't give the pills before seeing the patient. We do it re regularly in agriculture without asking the farmer we would like to promote something what we know. So what we believe, what we have learned in BIFE is that understand what the farmer's needs are and give them the right prescription. So you go with basket of programs and give them right thing, maybe a suitable entry point and cover entire holistic program. With that, we were able to do. Third thing we did was we were dependent on the government. Slowly, once the cattle development you know, started picking up, we started collecting money from the farmer. Today, the farmer whom we were giving two rupees, he gives 100 rupees per insemination. As a result, the quality of service improved. When the farmer gives money, he has demand. He has the kind of you know, power to ask for a better quality service. We, he was able to provide, so we are obliged. As a result, today we have 4,000 cattle breeding centers covering almost 60,000 villages spread over 16 states to the extent that you know we were deciding that we should not go to progressive states like Punjab. But last three years we have been in Punjab. We started with 100 cattle breeding centers in 1,500 villages. Today they want us to start 1,000 centers because you know that is the service. Probably the message is you need to get into free service to a kind of paid service where, where farmer it becomes partner. 
So this is the important thing, but also the most important learning. There are two or three key factors which we need to address. One, the women plays the most important role. We need to empower the women. You know, today government has a lot of money for the development. In the name of poor, 12th plan, we will be spending 4 lakh crores. So what is important is empower them to understand where the money is, how to get the money. Second thing is the important thing is children. 50% of the children today malnourished. If these children are malnourished, how do you go to the education? So we need to really, um, I'm thinking in the BIFE, as to can we go through school-centric development, you know, take the school as base, come back to the parents and see how we can help them. So another thing is, you know, make sure that you have good market, you have people's organization. Farmers have a kind of tendency that everything should be done by the government. Nobody will do. We have to stand on their own. These are the three important messages with which we are progressing further. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive set of programs that you have, uh, Dr. Hegde. Uh, just to, uh, and we'll get back to some, some of the questions that prompt uh, later, uh, just to change gears right now, uh, I'd like to talk to, uh, to you know, Dr. Kanitkar. Uh, different focus, different perspective. I mean, you, like us, uh, are a foundation, at, but of obviously at a different scale and uh, you work nationally and globally. Uh, so from your perspective, you know, other ecosystems, other challenges that you have seen, uh, you had shared some ideas with me before. So can you share with us, you know, what do you see as some of the challenges in terms of identifying an ecosystem uh, potential uh, growth and how you can encourage that? Thank you, Raj. Uh, happy to be here for the second year in the Deshpande Foundation. Uh, so, uh, I since enjoyed a very sumptuous breakfast, uh, I would like to sort of relate with that story and then connect it. Uh, this actually I heard from a colleague of mine in a different workshop, and uh, she gave a very interesting analogy for the ecosystem, uh, and I, I, I sort of improvised on what she suggested to me in that meeting. Uh, her analogy was, how does one cook a rice? How does one cook rice? She said, you need to put heat at the top, and also you need to heat it from the bottom. Uh, I added a little bit more versions to that. You need a good utensil. You need excellent firewood. You also need a kind of a supportive mechanism so that the rice that you cook also gets cooked at the right temperature, so on and so forth. In terms of the ecosystem, the experiences that we have is you need action at the ground level, what many of us call proof points, that it's important to show and demonstrate that 1,500 children would be served good meal delicious meal, sumptuous meal of good quality at the right time with necessary logistics. So that's the starting point. One needs good proof points. You need to establish a service center in a village, the way BIF has done that. And therefore, once you have established that, so that's probably hitting it from the bottom. But you also need a policy system, which actually takes note of these action research on ground. Otherwise, what we suggested is that these islands of excellence, they continue to remain, but one needs also supportive structure, announcements, interactions from the policy level. Many times in our country, as we have seen, we have excellent policy recommendations, but they remain in spiral bound volumes. So you need some connecting mechanism, which I call as a kind of a carrying utensil, call it a hybrid organization, call it a supportive uh, institutional mechanism, so that the policies that get framed in governments, in Delhi, in Karnataka, in Bangalore, in Hubli, are also able to get translated in action. But at the same time, you also need a kind of a support structure in terms of firewood. Firewood is in terms of financial resources. But many times, there are instances where finances, finances do bring in some kind of energy. But we also need large number of human resources. Just to give an example, and that's the example that I would like to quote. In the last seven years, there has been quite a big discussion on producer companies. These producer companies are seen as a substitute to cooperatives because cooperatives, for various reasons, have sort of lost their trust and faith and their ability to deliver to the people in the villages. So everybody is seeing in producer companies as a new mechanism that will bring farmers together, aggregate the produce that they do, sell it in the market, get benefits of information from the market, and in the end, we have more prosperity with the farmers. Now we have sort of seen there are about 200, 300 producer companies registered under the Indian Companies Act. And each producer company is doing, let's say, a business between 50 lakh rupees to a 1 crore rupee. 10 villages, 1,500 farmers, that's the ecosystem. Now you need a manager. You need a manager to manage a producer company handling a business of 1 crore worth of cotton or groundnut or soya or vegetables. Where do you get these managers? 
our management systems are not probably, management schools are not pro promoting education that would encourage students to go to these villages. Our colleges and polytechnics are not probably having the curriculum to sort of provide these kind of skilled resources. So then one needs to start with academics. So in other words, ecosystem as I see, and that's the point, is a kind of a puzzle that one sees unfolding. You, move, you promote a dairy, then you need to start looking at cattle feed. The moment you start looking at cattle feed, then you also need to link about, think about marketing. Then you need to think about who is promoting dairy. It's women, their empowerment. Then the moment you are looking at women, then you are saying, is the milk getting out of the system? What about children in the family? What, so in a way, it's kind of unfolding of a puzzle, a kind of looking at the system holistically, bringing academic institutions together, bringing policy makers together, bringing catalytic organizations together, the kind of hybrid organizations that one talks about. And therefore, in trying to integrate, and uh, yesterday I heard, and that I, I would like to conclude on that, I think collaboration is the key. Uh, interestingly, all of us talk about doing something new, but it's in silos. What I see as a model in building an ecosystem and coming to the point in terms of reaching scale is, if large number of organizations are able to collaborate together and at the same time compete together. And there I cite an example of cell phone companies. Cell phone companies compete very fiercely in the market when they have to attract new customers. But in the last years, they have realized that they need to share the cost of the tower. You cannot construct cell phone towers all over the place on your own uh, cost and pace. So they are collaborating. So at one place you are competing, at another place you are collaborating. And that's what I see as a mechanism where large number of stakeholders as a part of the system, irrespective of their apparent conflicting interests, start coming together on some shared understanding, and then they start looking at how do we cook rice better, is to heat from the top, heat from the bottom, get the right firewood, get a good utensil, and get several of these utensils cooking rice together so that we have some major impact happening. Thank you. Th thank you very much. That, that's a wonderful analogy, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be using that uh, in the future. So just to take off on the point, one of the points we made is you know, once you create the producer companies, you got to go and find the managers for it. So I want to talk, talk, you know, turn to Gauri, since you have this national kind of perspective, what are some of those challenges in finding the right people? You know, we have a number of these organizations that are growing, number of different areas. Uh, what do you see from the, you know, your perspective? Yeah, what, are, what are some of the opportunities and what can be done about it? Uh, thanks, Raj. Um, I mean, just to give you a little bit of a context, the National Skill Development Corporation has been created uh, to encourage private sector to look at skill development as a scalable, sustainable business. And uh, where this is coming from is the fact that, you know, um, India supposedly needs 500 million skilled people by 2022. The current capacity in India to skill is about 4.3 million. And if this grows at the rate at which it's been growing, it's likely to become 65 million by 2022 which means that the capacity has to increase almost eight times to meet the demand that will exist in 2022. In that context, I mean, the government and the national skills policy came up with the vision to say that, you know, this is not something that the government can do on its own. This is not something that corporates can support as part of their CSR. This is something which private sector needs to take up as a business opportunity. And that is where, you know, national uh, NSDC was created with the objective of providing patient funding to entities which are looking at skill development as a business. And um, very frankly, all that we think of is scale. Because because you know, if you have to reach that 500 million number, it is very important that our investee companies um, achieve a scale and achieve that scale very quickly. Uh, so, I mean, for to enable them to achieve that scale, it becomes imperative for us to create an ecosystem in which they can operate more effectively. So, what have we heard from some of the entities which are into skill development? And I'm sure there are lots of people in this room who who are engaging with that. The first is there is a huge challenge relating to uh, getting students to come in and actually get vocationally trained. That is, is coming out as a biggest, uh, as one of the biggest challenges in India. And um, it stems from a little bit of a cultural context in India where you know a person would rather be uh, a graduate and uh, be unemployed than be vocationally trained and employed. Right. The second challenge is that today there is a government certification, uh, you know, but there is no industry certification for vocational skills. And the third challenge is um, lack of good quality trainers. Uh, 
right? And in addition, there is a little bit of information asymmetry that exists in the market in terms of where are the people, what is the aspiration, and where are the training providers going to be located, right? So these are some of the ecosystem challenges that we see, and you know, there are quite a few things that are being done to plug these issues. And I'll just take an example of one of the uh, challenges, which is the biggest, which is to say student mobilization, or how do you get candidates to come to classrooms? So the, there were two issues identified there. The first one was that you know there was a genuine inability to pay because you know a lot of the candidates who were to get vocationally trained came from backgrounds where even you know paying two thousand rupees, five thousand rupees for a course was difficult. And the second challenge was about an unwillingness to pay. Right, so on the unwillingness part, um, there are a couple of initiatives which are being taken. For example, there is a national campaign which is going to come up uh, to say that you know uh, the tagline being "Hunar hai to kadar hai," which essentially means um, there is pride in vocation. So it's going to showcase, for example, the guy who made Sachin Tendulkar's bat, right, it's to say that you know who is the star, real star behind the star. Uh, so that is one thing which is going to, you know, uh, go deep into every part of the country. The second is, um, you know, there is, a, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it, something called the World Skills Competition, which is organized once every two years globally. And this is like an Olympics in skills, right? And so it is, it, and it includes participation from across trades, you know, hairdressing, uh, cooking, plumbing, right? And I, I, it was amazing. I mean, uh, two years back, uh, last year was the first time you know, an Indian delegation went there. And we were really badly prepared because it you, you should see the amount of effort that other countries are putting into this competition, right? So that is another thing that is coming in. In addition, you know, we are encouraging entrepreneurs through business plans, etc. So I mean, just to give you a little bit of a perspective that there are multiple things which, uh, which are being done at a policy level to help people scale. Thanks uh, for that perspective. And uh, finally, uh, uh, turning to you, uh, Tagarajan, uh, you know, we had BIF and Srijan that do kind of large uh, number uh, implementation in a number of different areas. Augusta, on the other hand, is much more focused. So how have you all grown and how have you all uh, scaled to deliver impact? Uh, can you just give us a little of the history? Glad to be here. Um, Augusta's uh, basic mission is to spark curiosity and creativity uh, at the student level and to a certain extent the teacher level as well. Um, we now run about 100 different uh, uh, locations, programs through 70 mobile labs and 30 science centers, getting children to do things hands-on rather than just go through a rote memory based uh, uh, didactic kind of work in the, in the classroom. Uh, uh, the teacher quality uh, is a bit of an uh, issue, as uh, Maya and others pointed out in yesterday's session. Um, and therefore, an intervention based on hands-on learning, using models and experiments, getting children to interact in class, ask questions, and go beyond what is written in the textbook is what we fundamentally do. Uh, we have scaled from something like one mobile lab in 10 years before to uh, today, uh, as I've said, 70 mobile labs, 30 science centers, reaching a million children in 12 states. That's what we do. And uh, right now, what is on our plate will make us just double that number in a single year. So we are going to be, we are in that tipping point, as it were, where our, uh, you know, the growth is going to be, will continue to be spectacular. Um, how do we do that? I mean, uh, you know, to, to, to get back to the uh, idea of uh, tipping point, I think one of the things that we have done is not just concentrated on the basic program that we do, which is bringing awareness, curiosity, creativity at the lowest level, but building on programs on top of that. So today we have a <coughs> suite of programs that we can mount on top of the basic program of awareness creation into interest, into curiosity into project-based learning, into creativity, and ultimately, hopefully, innovation. So the entire pyramid of uh, learning, of being curious, leading to innovation, is something that we have. We have programs catering to at different levels. Uh, the, the second thing is the coverage and the geographical uh, concentration that we have done 
earlier versus now trying to go to other states and making sure that ecosystems are created or if they exist, we become part of that. So this, this whole idea of tipping point of scale versus replication. Do you scale yourself or are you in a position to do replication even by means that are not directly branded as Augustia or whatever, but you're able to deliver the ultimate mission and vision. And that's where, uh, you know, working with governments, as uh, uh, Ms. Arya pointed out, is very important because ultimately, I think we can call ourselves successful when we can almost hand back to the government what we do. And they can do it in the same quality and in a massive scale. That's when you would have done real, uh, you know, scaling and replication. So our efforts are always to work in an integrated fashion with the government. We need the government support anyway because the children won't come to our science centers or attend our mobile lab sessions unless the government permits that. And therefore, working with them, uh, being appreciative of what they do rather than being critical and making sure that you, know, you pick up any opportunity for you to help the government do this. For instance, the, the uh, public-private partnership where you invest something and then the government invests a lot more than that, but you create uh, a, a much uh, bigger reach and much better quality and so on and so forth. So to us, scale versus replication, the replication will always take the uh, importance in defining the tipping point. And then of course, the other, other thing that we always look for is, do we now have the confidence to grow, scale, replicate, where we have strategies from financial to human resources to managerial ability uh, to hardware, software, infrastructure, all of that, the strategy and the execution capability to overcome these constraints and you're able to do that in a, uh, in a, in a kind of a process-oriented fashion where I can uh, replicate in the next state serious numbers of either mobile labs and so on. One of the, one of the things that I would like to point out is that constant innovation is the key. Uh, we, we had the uh, campus in uh, Kupam in Andhra Pradesh. From there, we went to, through the mobile lab route, we went to science centers where more work is done. And then we uh, uh, kind of understood that if this has to integrate with every school teacher, you've got to provide a mini lab practically every day to every teacher. How do you do that? And then therein was born the concept lab in a box, where we split up what we do in a mobile lab disaggregate it into 10 different boxes for 10 different subjects, give it to 10 schools, make the lab box stay in a school for a week, facilitate the teacher and the trainer, and then make sure that there is a lab kind of a thing present and therefore the teacher can engage in hands-on, excited, uh, learning on teaching every day of the week. Can we reach all those numbers? I think working with the government, we can. And as I said, we are at the tipping point to make it happen uh, particularly Karnataka is a great case and example where with enlightened leadership, the current leadership is amazing in terms of wanting to make things happen in the right spirit. And we are able to go into an ecosystem model as well as the uh, lab in a box oriented model to make uh, the system integrate with them and the government school teachers ultimately empowered to do what we do in the main. So great. that's the way we uh, are growing and uh, reaching the tipping point. Terrific. Uh, so among the four <clears throat> Among the four non uh, NGOs we have over here, we have a diversity in both breadth, but all of you all have you know, reached some critical mass uh, in terms of your growth. Uh, so I'd like to just kind of look under the covers, if I may, uh, you know, and ask you all, you know, what is it as you have grown over the last 10, 15, 20 years, was there a particular point in time when all of a sudden you saw growth accelerate? where there was some aha moment where you know, either an internal set of processes or procedures, or maybe there was an external catalyst that made that happen. What was it that uh, you know, was critical for your organization to achieve the next level of growth? Is it you being able to address the human resources issue in a more creative way? Was it some external partnership for foundations or funding? Uh, can each of you all kind of take a, you know, take that perspective and kind of share what your, uh, you know, your thoughts are. So let me start with uh, uh, Sridhar. Uh, you know, how have 
what was that critical point where all of a sudden you went from you know fifty thousand to uh, hundred thousand to you know the million? Uh, yeah, and what enabled you all? You know, what were there some management secrets uh, that we can uh, learn from you? <coughs> yes, uh, there have been, uh, I think, about uh, three or four important factors. Uh, number one is uh, we had some very good people, had and continue to have some very good people from the for profit sector from the business world uh, mentoring us advising us right from the very beginning so it's actually uh, being an NGO coming out of a religious organization we had our own limitations in our thinking in our perspectives but uh, these kind of inputs that we got right from the very beginning from the for people who are immersed in the for-profit sector that actually opened up our thinking and the connections they brought and the, and the kind of a uh, self-esteem that they built in us gave us confidence you know because without these ki these kind of things we are just doing, trying to do something, struggling. But then when we got that kind of a, uh, an exposure, it helped a lot. And I think they evangelized. They connected us to many important people. And that is continuing to happen. And in fact, I must appreciate uh, Desh Pandey, who is not only doing that, he has institutionalized that and making that kind of an uh, opportunity available to other NGOs. That I think is an extremely significant thing. Otherwise, s s you know, NGOs, small NGOs, we will just be crawling on the ground. We can't get to fly. <clears throat> the second important thing, which also came from, which is a result of our interaction with the people from the corporate world, from the very beginning, we had an aspiration to grow because our country is a country of numbers. If you are feeding 1,000 children, 2,000 children, and so on, you're barely scratching the surface of the problem. There is relevance. It's important, somebody who is doing small scale work, no doubt about it. But then if we want to create a certain amount of impact, you have to do it in big numbers. So that idea that we have to do it in big numbers on a, on a big scale was there from the very beginning. An aspiration was there. And if we have to do that, we have to use technology and we have to use good management practices. So all of those things were also part of the things that made us uh, grow. And the third important factor which uh, enabled us to grow was uh, government policy. In the year 2003 or so, the government changed the policy. There was only a dry ration distribution kind of a midday meal program all over the country except two or three states. The government changed the policy and said there has to be a cooked meal program. And uh, the government started allocating a huge sums of money. And so that's how we started getting Earlier, we were funding it all by ourselves. And then at a certain point, the government funds started coming. Like for instance, today, in Akshay Patra, the cost of a meal is 6 rupees 50 paisa. And we get about 4 rupees 50 paisa from the government. And we only have to raise another 2 rupees from other fundraising programs. So the government policies changed, and that also was an important factor. Uh, to scale up. And uh, last, very importantly, uh, we were Akshay Patra supported by a team of uh, ISKCON volunteers who were available, uh, dedicated volunteers to run the day-to-day -day operations. So all of these are important factors, I think, that helped us to scale up. That, that, thanks, thanks a lot. That, that's a great uh, 
set of perspectives. And let's see uh, if we can come up with some maybe common themes. So with, uh, how about you? Uh, was there some critical point in time when all of a sudden you all found the secret sauce? Uh, I think the tipping points that we just discussed are two. Either people begin to pay for your services or government begins to pick up your program. Either way, you've reached something, the, a point where somebody else can do it or people will do it for themselves. <coughs> so I think that is where one of the, that's what I derived by just this discussion. I, let me give you an example of uh, where we got two or three times our growth sort of picks up, picked up. The first I was talking to you about the government collaboration. So our HR idea that we had learned earlier in Pradhan was that you need quality human resources to service the poor. When we began with the, uh, before we started uh, implementation, we began to work with several World Bank programs. And we found that even though you may have a great idea to work with a $100 million program in every state, but there are no available committed human resources within the government to go and implement in the villages that need to be served. So we came up with a methodology of selection, which is very different from the GRE and the SET and the types where you only look at mental ability or you may look at an IQ, or etc. We said we would select people on the basis of attitude and motivation to serve and what we call otherwise commitment. And otherwise, in, but you know these tests sometimes, the psychology people or the organizational behavior uh, professors will say these are very inexact methodologies. To how do you know whether this guy has the motivation to go and serve the poor and you know feed the meals, etc. But we came up with some methodology. We could scale it up in Madhya Pradesh, and today, because of these solutions that have been adopted by uh, several World Bank projects. Government of India accepted our recommendation for NREGA that every backward block where Naxalites are, I mean, we should not call them Naxalites, we should be represented of people who want better life for themselves, we would place a team of dedicated human resources there. So I think uh, the key uh, in this tipping point was that we got our idea to sell and be accepted by a government officer and then we sort of could do it that way. So this is the uh, one example I can say that when we can uh, go and sell a completely new idea to the government and there is the, it solves a problem which is very, very real, then we can get a scale up. See, this is the, uh, another example I want to uh, talk about is when a donor picked up our idea of a productivity announcement and that's why we reached very, critical scale and that is the, the key thing there was again nothing that we did but a package of technology for soybean and a productivity announcement had been actually innovated in a laboratory of ICAR National Research Center for Soybean in Madhya Pradesh all we did was we brought it to Rajasthan we adapted to rain fed conditions of soya cultivation whatever innovation we did and Bangay, this company, and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, you have to scale it up. So all we did was we tried this thing up, and then we mobilized the farmers around the technology. And so the push came, as in your case, from a donor who said that we cannot give you, as I initially asked, $300 per farmer. They said our asymptotic figure, the figure that we will stabilize on is $20 per farmer. So we had to innovate and uh, cut down the cost of human resources to reach out. Today we are at 12,000 farmers because of that. So I think this is where we were able to come up with the package of practices that were very simple, which a local youth could sort of take it to every farmer and then see for it himself or herself that productivity was going up by 50% and profit was going up by 150%. So this was uh, what was happening. So. This is the, the other two examples I'll give and stop here. Thank great. you. Uh, great. Just to change gears, uh, Ajit, from your perspective, from uh, yeah, the foundation, what are some of the enablers? You talked about the ecosystem. You're using uh, producer companies as an example. What are some of the enablers that you think you know a, a foundation like yours can kind of inject into that ecosystem? 
to accelerate it and to move it forward, you know, what are some of the levers that you can pull or that others could pull? Thanks. I think uh, to sort of link it to the earlier points, uh, my sense is that as, as one sees scale, there are possibilities of reaching scale. I think these critical interventions also sort of keep emerging. And in a way, it's slightly opportunistic, but also strategic. Uh, for instance, there are 300 producer companies in the country as of now. Uh, and the government uh, promoted agency, Small Farmer Agribusiness Consortium, SFAC, which is a part of Ministry of Agriculture, has a dream of having 10,000 producer companies in next five years. So that's the kind of ambition. That's the kind of a game plan. And many of the organizations that we are partnering with want to sort of be a part of that journey. So now, two critical, uh, uh, that's what I, uh, coming back to the, uh, the usage of the word strategic, but at the same time opportunistic. One of the key constraints that we have noticed in last couple of years, last two years actually, is that these producer companies have weak balance sheet. Even if farmers come together, start with their equity capital of 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, as an entity, as a commercial entity, their equity is not going to enable them to attract debt funds from the banking system. Therefore, at some stage, we need to strengthen the balance sheet of these producer companies if they have to do a reasonably good business of 4 crore, 5 crore, 10 crore in a regional economy. Uh, now, how does one encourage the public system, the banking system, to lend to these producer institutions? They need working capital typically for six months. At the beginning of the season, to buy fertilizers, to buy seeds, so that could be March, April, May. They also need another set of work, working capital, let's say around harvest time, which is September, October, November. When the produce is harvested, it is sold, but the farmers need that money. Now, what is the nature of this working capital? 20 lakh, 30 lakh, 40 lakh, 50 lakh rupees. Just to give an example, if I am working with a producer company having 1,000 farmer members. Now, the commercial banking system will have enough money, theoretically, to lend these 20, 30, 40 lakhs to these producer companies. But they are rather cautious, because these entities have not established their track record. They don't have a four-year good balance sheet that will enable them to get this money. Now, that's precisely what I call as being strategic, but also being opportunistic. We saw an opportunity as a foundation. We sort of started collaborating with Friends of Women's World Banking India, based in Ahmedabad. And we said, FWWB, why don't you sort of lend this 20, 30, 40 lakh rupees to these producer companies? We will constitute a fund with you. You start with 10, 15 these producer companies. Let there be one or two such lending cycles. These organizations get the money, not at cheap rate, not at free rate, but maybe at 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%, 10%, just below the market rate. They use that money as a working capital loan, buy seeds, buy fertilizers, buy the produce, sell it, and repay it back to FWWB as a lending organization. And if they are able to do this for two, three years, well, I am sure the State Bank of India, the Punjab National Banks of the world will start chasing these producer companies. Le lo paisa, hum de rahe paisa. They will say, okay, take this money. But for them to have this credibility and establish a kind of a track record, somebody needs to invest some kind of risk money. As a foundation, we are happy that we could take that risk. We have a good partner like Friends of Women's World Banking. They already have made about 10 such loans in last financial year. And if they are able to do this for another year, I'm sure the banking system will come. We are out of the scene. We are happy to be out of the scene. We cannot fund 10,000 producer companies with the kind of resource that we have. So at one level, we are opportunistic. We have seen a gap. If this gap is somehow removed, probably the sector, the ecosystem will move one step ahead. And therefore, we have partnered. FWW on their own also will not be able to support 300 producer companies. They might support 20, 30 organizations. Once these 30, 40 organizations are able to establish track record, the mainstream banking system will come in. They will come with big funds. And the 10,000 producer companies that are going to be promoted in next five year plan, probably their uh, access to funding resources would have established. So in a way, our role as a funder would be to be able to take risk. We are happy to take that risk. Probably some of the loans might fail. We'll take that as a failure. There will be some learning in that. And once we have reached that learning, we'll then disseminate this learning and encourage the mainstream banking system to come in. So in a way, it's strategic, opportunistic, willingness to take risk, being 
nimble on our feet, being able to do that quickly in the next three, six months, and then we are out of it. That would be some of the roles that we would like to play. In That's this great. Product. So basically having the long-term view, but then identifying those leverage points where you can be the catalyst and be able to push them over the edge. And then that's the tipping point where they'll scale up. Sure. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, let me just turn to the, uh, both uh, Dr. Hegde and uh, Tiago. From your perspectives, you know, what has been some of the enablers? Uh, you know, where have you all suddenly accelerated at BAIF? Uh, and then you know, later, Tiago with Agassiya. I can identify three important components for acceleration. One could be funding, second could be human resources, third could be the brand image. With regard to funding, uh, having said that uh, today, government has a lot of money. Uh, even before we make the farmers to contribute, there is ne it's necessary to bring in a lot of money. Because, you know, for example, uh, when you are uh, dealing with these poor people, their resources are uh, not uh, adequately ready for preparation, for production. For example, if you are promoting mango, Poor man has very bad land, with deprived of water and fertilizer. If he has to compete with the rich farmer who has already established mango orchard, he will never be able to take a loan, develop the land, bring water, and you know produce the same quality mango at the same price. So, basic cost of development need to be supported. You know, many times the government programs have failed, where you know you start from the very beginning with the loan. Having said that, you know there is a lot of money for the government. We have, we as NGOs have a habit of uh, criticizing the government and in the end we end up with criticizing good people. Our founder Manibai said, you know, that uh, there are very good people in the government, there are very bad people in the NGOs. It's all, you know, the system and the where you work, it's not the people. I have fantastic uh, officers with whom we have worked, they have been supporters. I have met uh, Dr. Sharma is here. There are such people who create such a position in the government that next two predis, his, their successors cannot change the good thing what they have done. So we need to really tap them and you know, see how you can uh, you know, a, a, enjoy their patronage support. Similarly, NABARD, one of the best organizations for as far as development is concerned, although there are a lot of criticism, but we need to know how to handle them. Our learning is that you know, do not teach anything to the government. You show what you, can done, what you have done, what you can do, bring them and show. The best thing is to do that, then the government officer says, if you can do, we can certainly do. That's the way we should be able to bring government on our side. Because, you know, Indira Gandhi, when she was prime minister, she was telling, we have to take, it, take up in the government. In the government, who is government? It's nobody knows, you know. Government is a framework of iron, framework of laws. So we cannot, we should not get into abusing government, nor, you know, trying to teach the government. You try to be friend with the government, with your principles. I must tell you that you know we bring about 120 crores from government out of 150 crores. We don't pay even one rupee bribe to anybody. It takes time, but you know it's you need to be firm. Once you are very firm, you should be you should be able to show you a good work. You should be able to get a lot of money from the government. That's one thing. Human resources is extremely difficult. You need de dedicated people. You need technical people. We have seen you know young dedicated people, so young technically qualified people come. If they work with us for two years, their market value goes up five times. You know, it's extremely difficult when somebody comes, a dedicated man says, shows his employment, you know, order, says, I got five times more money. I have to pat him and say, go as our ambassador, don't, you know, stay here. Because, you know, so having learned, seen that, we have developed a mechanism of developing the local youth, unemployed youth, as the grassroots level workers. As uh, with G said, it is the passion, it is the commitment which is very important. If that is, that is there, then we can have few good technical people at the top and teach them, train them from time to time. What is important is these committed people need to mentor. Poor require, you know, they have psychological poverty. They say, they come to a stage of dependency syndrome. You say anything, they think nothing is going to work. There are good people who have done damage to them. There are good people who have gone with good technical, peop technical things, but still they have failed. So people say they are very skeptical about when white collar people go to the village and start talking. So we need to create an ambience to show that you know they have to work on their own, you are sincerely available. That is called mentoring, hand holding. Having people, you know, young youth, even the housewives we have trained, they do excellent job. So they can have link with our technical people. With that you should be able to, with less technical qualified people, you have a good program, 
which the delivery system at the grassroots level can be formed. Third thing is brand imaging. What's important, we create a lot of stories, but you know, the credibility is a big question sometimes. It has to work. It's not enough if it works somewhere, it has to work everywhere, wherever we take. So that's important to have a good model. We have, for our WADI program, a cattle development program, we have brought farmers from Assam, Tripura, and showed them in Karnataka, Gujarat. Once they see, that's, they start believing. So it's important to create a brand image. Then, you know, you, people should be in a position to say, okay, if BIFE says, or if XYZ says, it is taken for granted. Otherwise, people start doubting, so your program can be. They should own, they should have kind of trust in the program which we, uh, you know, promote. Then I think things will become very, very easy. I think in the uh, 13 odd years that Agassi has been in existence, we've been gathering momentum from the initial years. There are several milestones uh, like the campus and getting the land for the campus in 2001 and uh, having some buildings on it by about 2004-05. 2007-08 I think was uh, important in uh, several ways, 8, 9, 7, that area, when we started getting some of the things that uh, Dr. Hegde referred to. Uh, the first government relationship started then, um, and then uh, uh, eight nine the sandbox uh, involvement, which has been one of the most crucial things for us to reach the tipping point, and I'll explain in a moment. Um, but all these are gathering momentums and milestones. I would say the the acceleration, uh, confidence, and the rain clouds, the, the gathering around to uh, get all that done happened somewhere around. 2010-11, when all these things kind of came together in scale, like funding. Uh, we could have uh, backing from the Sandbox and a couple of other uh, munificent uh, corporations and, uh, and uh, HNIs and so on. Uh, we, we could depend on that around that time. The government funding started kicking in through the government program that we engaged in in Karnataka and the main. Uh, so the funding part was giving us more and more confidence. Um, the uh, maturity in dealing with government happened having gone through one full contract and renewed that with a greater number in Karnataka and being able to approach and you know working with school and communities. The maturity of dealing with governments, schools and communities happened around the same time as 2011-12. The sandbox experiment was uh, yielding a lot of results from the point of view that it, it allowed us to experiment, it provided us the catalyst, it allowed us to prototype. I talked a little while earlier about uh, how do you reach further and talked about the lab in a box and a point and this is where in, in the Hubli sandbox that we did the first set of things, proving them, prototyping them, learning from the mistakes, emphasizing the positives, enhancing the resources that are required and all of that was done uh, with the help of the ecosystem that was provided by Sandbox, again around the same time. And the brand that uh, Dr. Hegde talked about, nationally known, the campus helped, and all the work that we had done both with the uh, private sector funding as well as the government funding and so on, all of that again came together and people. Most important thing, we were able to attract greater number of good people. We were able to reconcile in our own mind what Dr. Hegde said that good people in two years will leave and therefore can you take that as a given and, and as uh, Naveen pointed out earlier, uh, a conveyor belt system by which you know you recognize that they're going to be there for 18 to two years but take the best out of them and give them something in return, they become ambassadors kind of realization. Therefore your entire recruitment training program was focused towards the fact that this is not going to be really long term. And the, the other thing that happened is, uh, you know, uh, as Dr. Arya pointed out, your own realization that you don't really need an MSc chemistry or a physics uh, to do the work that we need to do. What you really need is, as we are fond of saying, a BEE -E degree, which is not electrical engineering, but energy, enthusiasm, excitement. And therefore, you can always pick up somebody uh, who's not really a, a physics dada, but uh, is, has got the energy, enthusiasm to go to the class and make the child uh, curious and interact with the child. Therefore, our recruiting practices at the foot soldier level also started changing around the same time. Uh, with the result, today we have the confidence built out of the brand, 
the maturity in dealing with governments and uh, other areas, the, the, the catalyzing prototyping that we got together from the sandbox, good people, uh, both at the managerial level and at the um, uh, foot soldier level, and the funding certainties and so on and so forth, that I would say the takeoff or tipping point uh, is, is around the 10, 11, 12 kind of uh, time that today we are poised to really double our growth in, in a year. Great. Uh, one common theme that all four of the uh, it, uh, all four of the NGOs have is uh, human resources, uh, and they have challenges, obviously, and they've addressed the challenges in innovative and different ways. Uh, Gauri, from your perspective, are, are there uh, things happening out there that you see that might be feeding into the pipeline that they're looking at? You know, are they programs that you see, are there opportunities over there maybe to build programs that would help support the kind of, uh, you know, the, the grassroots needs that the, the, these organizations have? Um, you know, as I, I mean, as I think uh, all of you mentioned, I don't think funding is an issue. So there is a lot of gov money available. I think what is uh, what people, at least in the government, are looking to uh, figure out is people who can literally take the headache of implementation for them right and deliver in a manner in which you know the um, the result is tangible right so for example from a skills perspective uh, there is employment which is generated and people are not only skilled and left to be uh, employed and the second is that uh, I mean the institutions are over able a period of time able to create a brand and credibility for themselves because you know a lot of uh, the issues are because uh, you know the users are not able to uh, trust the entities which are in operation you know and that's primarily because over a period of time a large number of entities have just come into existence and you know so there needs to be a credibility established for the organizations which are in the field um, in addition I think it's important to establish the systems and processes because um, you know funding is available uh, but uh, it's very important to track and monitor the output Right, and uh, you know, there is where I feel, um, you know, over a period of time, a lot of our partners are working on those systems and processes because of which, you know, when they establish their brand and credibility, they're able to scale up much faster. So, um, there are enough and more programs available in the um, in the system, the government system. Now with uh, you know the uh, CSR initiatives of corporates, I'm sure there is a lot of money available. I think the brand and the systems and processes become two critical elements which feed into organizations uh, to scale up. Thank you. Go ahead, Ajit. Yeah. Uh, just to add uh, this uh, human resources, just to give an example, we have a National Rural Livelihood Mission that got established by Government of India last year, and it's going to also work in 13 states. One estimate that has been said is that therefore we would, uh, this state would have an autonomous society and would recruit professionals at different levels. One estimate that was uh, put up uh, by the government in different meetings was that we need one lakh trained livelihood professionals, those who will work at the block level and the cluster level, and who will interact with communities and then teach them, help them, catalyze livelihood activity promotion. Now the question that many of us are struggling is that, uh, do our management institutions, do our social work institutions, do our rural management institutions have those kind of courses designed to train may not be a two-year full PGP on livelihood promotion, but maybe a certificate course of six months, maybe a diploma of six months, maybe an interactive module using media technology where people who are BSc, BAs, BCOMs, who are from ITIs would actually get trained in appropriate livelihood promotion. For example, how do you do livelihood mapping in a village? Now, there is no module available. How do you do market assessment of haldi, turmeric, if you are going to promote livelihood activity based around turmeric? What is appropriate technology needed for groundnut decortication if I have to work in Anandpur village? Now, these are small modules. How do you organize women and link them to bank, nearest bank, and op help them in opening bank account? We have training modules, but that rests largely with the uh, NGO community. We have some of them, uh, most of them are in English. Therefore, there is a massive need to have these short-term curriculums, diplomas, electives, specialized courses, at least in 30, 40 management institutions across the country, starting with IMA, IMB, to XLRI, to IRMA, 
to management institutions, colleges, College of Social Work, so that we have 10, 20,000 professionals being trained, being certified, you are, uh, you are emphasis on quality, and then they get placed in livelihood promotion activities. CSR is coming with big money. Now CSR, they would need livelihood professional to work in the communities where their company or factory premises are located. Now how do you have these professionals? So, so somebody learns on the job, that's good, it's not bad, but then you also need quite a bit of back-end uh, back support and that would need to happen quickly next two, three years so that we have these many professionals. I'm talking only about livelihood. Probably one would uh, across sectors need that sure, kind of sure. uh, human resource support. Wait, you had to add something to that? To add to this and I'll make one more point uh, that related to innovation sandboxes. We did a paper uh, that Ajit is aware of for National Advisory Council to apply this learning from rural livelihoods program across sectors. You look at SSA, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, you look at NRHM, National Rural Health Mission, same thing would apply there also. But how many management education, is management institutes or social work institutes <coughs> are producing passionate and capable professionals to go out and work? So 70,000 or 1 lakh is just an estimate for NRLM. But if you look at SSA, we need teachers to do RTE, right to education, which requires uh, action-based learning or other things. But you know, you have teachers in tribal areas who are not there. You have one teacher schools in so many places. In one district like Dungapur, there are 2,000 schools, but most of the schools are one teacher schools. So if you extend this human resource thing, I think somewhere the country has failed the poor people in terms of producing committed people, we have gone to IITs and IIMs and so on, but uh, if you ask Amartya Sen, what is the biggest failure of India, he says the elites of India. So I think this is where the biggest challenge is. But one more thing I want to talk about is that innovation is required, sandbox kind of approach is required, both at the time when you are developing a prototype, at the same time also when you are scaling up in another location. We have taken the SRI program, which Naveen and the Desh Pandey Foundation has supported here, to Chhattisgarh, where we found another fund. The funding is not a problem. Again, we have aimed for 10,000 farmers in SRI there. But again, we need some innovation because the uh, SRI, which our farmers here are doing, the tribal farmers have to learn again in their conditions and so on. So I think second round of innovation is required if we want to go and work in poorer and maybe more difficult areas. That's where I think the importance of sandboxes like Desh Pandey Foundation is set up. And my urge, my request is that Desh Pandey Foundation should look at India-wide kind of a platform for establishing these kind of sandboxes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Wade.